Welcome to the second night of Third Eye TV. My name's Stuart Smith and I'll be your guide to jazz, improvise and experimental music at the Glasgow's pioneering multi-art space, the Third Eye Centre. Opened in 1975, the Third Eye lives on today as a centre for contemporary arts. This series of TV shows offers a taster of the digital archive we are sharing through the CCA website. Last night you heard all about the Third Eye founding director Tom McGrath and his circle. Tonight. We take a wider look at free music in the Third Eye archive, with vintage video from Julius Eastman, Derek Bailey and local group Andy Law Project. Most exciting of all, we'll be unveiling previously unseen footage of John Chakai, Danny Thompson and John Stevens at the Third Eye in 1976. As far as we know, this is the only recording of this trio in existence, and it's beautiful. Before I take you through tonight's programme, let's go back to 1973, when McGrath was appointed Glasgow Director of the Scottish Arts Council. From his base at the Scottish Arts Council Gallery on Blythwood Square, McGrath published Newspeak, a freewheeling newspaper at which publicised local events and outlined plans for the Third Eye. In issue 3, McGrath confessed that he did not know what art is, but it is the opposite of alienation. Being artistic, he writes, means being completely involved, bursting with ideas, enthusiasm and patience. That's how I think everyone should be all the time in everything they do. To fulfil that dream would entail social revolution. Right on. These utopian aims informed his vision for the Third Eye, which was to forge an organic relationship with its locality and reject the elitism of scenes where art is something to discuss over cocktails. The idea was to give people access to things that zap the mind, whether it be folk music, Disney movies or German opera. Art, he concludes, is whatever you can get away with. I can dig that. Guitar genius Derek Bailey played Blythwood Square in 1973. We start this evening with a surviving video of that gig. That's followed by a solo saxophone tribute to Bailey by one of his protégés, Tony Bevan. Tony hosts the improvisation session Help Me I'm Melting at Glasgow's Old Hairdressers every other Saturday. If you haven't been already, get in about it. To introduce the video of Chikai, we speak to the late saxophonist, ex-wife and biographer Marguerite Neighbour. And to follow, we hear from the legend that is Danny Thompson himself. Cellist Sammy Wu and poet Juana Adcock present their video piece I Scan the Room, followed by vintage Glaswegian skronk from the Andy Law Project, featuring the late Nick Weston on drums and Partick legend Alan Tall on saxophone. One of the gems of the Third Eye video archive is footage of Julius Eastman's creative associates playing in Glasgow School of Arts Haldane building in 1974. Eastman, who died in 1990, has in recent years gained overdue recognition as a pioneering figure of the New York avant-garde. The extract of his piece Stay In It is something else. Bassoonist Joe Key came across the video a few years ago on Mary Jane Leach's website. She's the composer who's championed Eastman's work in recent years. He was so inspired, he transcribed it for performance by his own ensemble. He'll talk to us tonight about the process. Bringing the night to a close, we have a DJ set from artist, musician and dancer Letitia Pleiades that explores the Third Eye's continuing legacy of experimentation through a selection of music from Glasgow's more recent past with a focus on female voices. So, strap yourselves in, get yourselves a drink, open your Third Eye and get free.
Uh, my name is Tony Bevan, and um, I play the saxophone. I play tenor and soprano and bass saxophone. And I first met Derek Bailey in about 1985, I think. Um, and then the first time I played with him was maybe a couple of years later. I used to run a club in Oxfordshire with uh, Greg Kingston. And he'd met Derek, and so we invited Derek to come down and play. Um, and then I suppose the main turning point, if that's the right word, was the company 1988, which was the uh, regional company where Derek invited people from not the usual improvisational centres. So there were people from uh, Alabama and people from Leeds and people from Hull. Uh, and at the last minute, he invited uh, Greg Kingston and um, Matt Lewis and myself to come and play um, from Oxford. So we didn't make it onto the, uh, the, the, the pamphlet that came out with it. But I got to play with Derek and Gavin Bryars and it went really well, really good. And at the end of it, Derek said to me, uh, do you want to do a company? And, Crawley, and he said it's two hundred pounds. I said, I don't know if I can afford that, Derek. And he said, No, we pay you. I'm not going to try his accent. So I did. I did company with him, and then over the years, I played with him many, many, many times. And he got to be a very good close friend. Um, and he used to come and stay with me when I lived in the country in Oxfordshire. Him and Karen, his uh, partner and wife. Uh, we used to, I used to go up with my then girlfriend and stay in Downs Road. And he was a wonderful, wonderful man, very, very funny. Uh, 
and an extraordinary musician. Um, one of the most important people, the most wonderful people I've met in this life.
Thank you. Thank 
I am Marguerite, Marguerite Neiber. I'm from Holland and um, I'm a piano player and I used to be married with John Jikai. I, um, I got to know him at a workshop where he was teaching and I thought his concept of music was very special. And uh, yeah, I followed it and I got together with him and moved with him to America and played with him. And I thought his, yeah, the way he, the way he conceived his music was very special. And he had such a, so many unusual stories to tell. And so then I, I thought there should be a book about him and there still wasn't a book about him. John died in 2012. Mm -hmm. And around that time I decided that the, that I should be the one to write it. If nobody else was going to do it, then I would do it. John's That's father was a Congolese. Mm -hmm. He came to, to Denmark in uh, a, yeah more than 100 years ago. And um, he, he met John's mother at a certain time. Mm -hmm. And um, John's mother was Danish. So John was born in Copenhagen just before the war. And he the family moved to Aarhus. That's a little little smaller town in Denmark near the harbor and uh, he grew up yeah playing a lot there in the forest and, and, and everywhere and uh, when he got in touch with jazz music he uh, started to listen to that he bought a, an, an alto sax he was like 16 then at the time and then he started to play and um a little later, he moved to Copenhagen and played with uh, with the musicians there. And then in the early 60s, he went to to New York City because he found out that he wanted to do more uh, what was called avant-garde or more free jazz. And uh, he wanted to be around people who were also into that music. So that's why he went to New York City in the 60s, early 60s. And he played with Archie Shep and Roswell Rudd and Don Jerry and... Uh, um, Albert Ehler mm -hmm. and many others and he was asked to record with John Coltrane mm -hmm. so he's playing on Ascension mm -hmm. uh, that famous record from John Coltrane from 65 a little later he moved back to Denmark mm -hmm. and from then on he, he traveled a lot to, to other countries and played in Denmark yeah yeah, yeah. and then he was all in the, into the 60s and Provo and then also more the like the like, the spiritual movement came up, like or spiritual with the movement with gurus and ashrams, and uh, that interested him a lot. He got mm -hmm. all, he went to an ashram and started doing meditation and yoga, and he even he stopped performing music at that time. And he became a school teacher and was teaching music to 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 children. Yeah, and I think you d you describe some of the the lessons. Um... And the approach he took in those, um, maybe you could tell me a little bit a bit about that, because when we when people watch the video, they might be able to see some of those ideas being uh, applied to the music. In John's music, he was always from the beginning. He was into the rhythm, mm. and he was um, looking at short elements of of like little motives, yeah. and yeah. repeating them and changing them. Um, moving them to different tones or uh, changing the, the the ending a little bit. So you, it always gave a rhythmical bass. Um, he, he already did that in the 60s. But then um, in the 70s, he went to, into the, that meditation thing. And there he often used uh, mantras. Mm. Uh, and that is like uh, in your mind, you 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 have a certain phrase and you try to keep your mind to to that phrase to that mantra all the time and of course you start thinking of other things but you try to come back to that mantra and that can give stability to your mind mm -hmm. and um john also applied that to that music to his music i think um because he works yeah he started working even more with with ostinatos like that is a musical little phrase that you repeat and you make can make variations, you come back to that ostinato. And that also makes that music doesn't go all over the place, but has points that you can refer to that give structure to the music. 
Yeah, John did that a lot, and I, I, I think in this in this recording with John Stevens, he, he he's also applying that. Um, for instance, in the part where they are singing, and he is also playing a little saxophone before that, huh? Before mm. they start singing, and that was nice too. Yeah, John often likes to compose melodies, mm. and um, and for instance, if there was a concert where the where the musicians were playing free a lot of the time and John likes to come back to to uh, to, to a certain composition at a certain time mm-hmm. so so that structure the music the music would get more shape mm-hmm. and stability and in in this recording in this concert you also see him at the end playing a playing a melody mm-hmm. and uh, I think he's playing it like two or three times and maybe they're playing something else like in the middle where he's having playing together a lot with the basses, with the bass. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not quite sure, but he might be playing in that melody as also. Right. He always likes to bring some compositions along. Yeah, yeah. Maybe four for a set, and uh, maybe maybe everybody was improvising, and he was the only one that played that melody. But he he he, he liked very much to put it in there. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, he, and he also often asked if the other people had had compositions, and then he was happy to play. Yeah, to play those. He had compositions that that changed meter often, mm. or that were parts were in five and in seven, and then <laughs> and then sometimes you know it was written in five, and he he practiced it in five, but then during the concert he would play. He he would, for instance, stop very much on one note. So in the end, it became mm. six. Anyway, yeah. it became more regular, but it, it, sometimes it looks very complicated. Mm-hmm. Around that time of that gig in, in Glasgow, he really got back into playing. He, he, he got the taste again of performing mm-hmm. and playing together with musicians. And yeah, he had his projects in different countries. And during the 80s, it became more and more. And he started, uh, he got chances to travel more. He, he went on a tour to, to Iran and India. Mm-hmm. And uh, one time he went to Japan and stayed there for a month and played with with musicians there. He went to Africa in the mid eighties to Guinea, Conakry, and some countries nearby. And there are records of that available. John liked to combine different kinds of music, mm-hmm. so he was also he liked classical music also a lot, and he liked folk music a lot and kind of world music influences. So he combined all that in his compositions. And so he worked for for ensembles where part of the musicians were classical musicians. And um, uh, those those works were performed sometimes. They they haven't been recorded much of the, or that the recordings are not good. But um, yeah, he started doing that more and more. And then in the 90s, in the early 90s, he got the chance to move back to America, to California. And uh, I moved with him. He had this group that played very groovy world music stuff that could turn free and uh, very composed, very all of a sudden like pieces in seven or in five or um, different meters. Yeah, and it was a really nice group mm. uh, that we were together for four years, I believe. And mm. and yeah, John was also still traveling, going back to Europe to play with, with European musicians. Mm. He had different projects. He was always, he kept busy. Yeah. And in 2000, he was asked to write a large piece, which was set to a hymn. A kind of a combination of religious music also. Mm-hmm. Um, and they performed that in a few churches in Denmark in 2001. Mm. Uh, and in 2001, we moved back to France, to, to Europe, and settled down in France, in the south of France. From then on, John didn't teach very much anymore, but he still traveled and performed with uh, with the young musicians who asked him to play with him. John was very much for staying in the moment mm. and feeling what was going on in the moment and what kind of musical inspiration you heard inside 
and then trying to play that, keeping the connection with your own sound and your own heart and with also what you heard from other people, from the other musicians around you. Mm -hmm. And uh, trying to make a connection with the audience, with the listener. So the music would uplift the spirits. He wanted to bring to to work for the feeling the people feeling one of oneness for all of us, for everybody, mm. through his music. He yeah. wanted to do that. He thought you could music you could make music with everything and from everywhere. Mm -hmm. And there were no limitations. The only limitations were like in your mind. But if you tried to to do away with those, those limitations and there's so much different music possible yeah. and he always encouraged everybody to try to make your own music and not try to play like anybody like, like someone else like a famous guy or something mm. just try to play what comes from yourself
to me, it was just, it was a fantastic place. Mm, mm. And I've always been an enormous fan of Glasgow. Mm -hmm. it, it, enormous fan of Glasgow. Um, at that time, you know, it, it used to mess around with Billy Connolly and John Martin and, and go in there. And, and if I'm right in thinking, it was a vegetarian place, wasn't it? And so we used to go in there and have uh, vegetable or something or other. But that gig was was, was a great experience working with John Chikai. And one anecdote that I can tell you, which which highlights how how John Stevens was as a geezer, mm -hmm. was uh, during the evening John Chikai turned to John Stevens and said, "Listen, I don't want you to play." In this piece, I don't want you to play that drum <laughs> or that cymbal, and I don't want you to use sticks. I want you to use brushes. Okay? And he, he looked very sternly at John. <laughs> so John said, yeah, okay then. Uh, and no, I don't want you to play those notes, and I don't want you to play at that part of the saxophone. <laughs> okay? <laughs> So John, John Chikai just took it amazingly well and laughed. <laughs> ah, that's that's a... one of the things that I loved about John. He, he just he just didn't handle, but you know, the fact that we were working many times with different people from America or something. Mm -hmm. He didn't uh, he didn't treat them like they were some kind of idol, and he was nothing. You know, he was he was great. Mm -hmm. So I remember that night vividly well. Yeah, he was a remarkable bloke. He really was. And he took no prisoners. He, <laughs> he, he, he was, yeah, he was, he was a great man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he, he played up in, in Glasgow a lot in those days, or both with like Steve Lacey a few times. Um, That's right. That great, great band with um, like Kent Carter on bass, uh, Steve away. Potts, yeah, and Derek Bailey. And Away, yeah, Away played up in, in Glasgow as well. That's right, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he was certainly, you know, uh, a, a, the champ of, of that music at the mm, time, you know. Yeah. And I, the Third Eye Centre was just a fantastic place. It was just uh, one of those great places that, that, that used to attract uh, music lovers. Well, every kind, actually. Mm -hmm. People were just generally open-minded about everything. I just used to go to the Third Eye regardless of what was on, you know. Yeah, yeah. Which I think was, was the appealing thing about the play hall. I mean. mm. And looking at that footage, I mean, the response to the gig was quite remarkable. Um, Whereas in London, I think the night before we played at the Play of Stockwall, and I think mm -hmm. most, of the, most of the noise was taken up by people ordering pints of beer rather mm. than listening to the music, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've got really good memories of, and I always preferred Glasgow as opposed to Edinburgh. Mm. Because, you know, for it just seemed more honest, mm -hmm. and you know, it, it was le it was less of a a flight for your flair kind of audience. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> they are <shut> the are whole. <laughs> So we used to get on, you know, and obviously when I was working with John Martin, who lived in Glasgow, yeah, yeah, uh, we knew every kind of place to, to, to get to, you know, and, mm -hmm. and have a good time, you know. Yeah. The Victoria Bar and a few other places. I was really, really thrilled to, to know that that, uh, that you were doing uh, the story of the Third Eye Centre because it was a remarkable place. It, well, it, it, it is fantastic for people like me that... that you know, had associations with many people like John Stevens, mm. who were mates, and you know, sadly died. You know, over twenty years ago, mm. and so this is a fantastic thing for me to have, and I really, really do appreciate it. Oh, pleasure, yeah. And yeah. also, it was a very rare, a very rare trio: John Chikai, mm. myself, and John Stevens. Yeah, because I, I couldn't find any other references to to that trio other than the plough gig. No, that was it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, because in those days, uh, we were all bringing up families, and we played with. We we had no prejudices at all with music, mm -hmm. and I found that um, 
was harmonious with the with the attitude of Third Eye Centre. There were no prejudices. Yeah, it yeah. wasn't like oh we have we only have modern jazz or we have folkies or we have. It was really open minded and it was a, a very unique place. The title of the piece is I Scan the Room for a Familiar Face, but I'm the Only One Who's Out of Place. It's a seven-part audio-visual performance piece based on seven situations in Juana Adcock's living room. Juana is a brilliant poet, translator, writer, editor and improviser based in Glasgow, and I asked Juana to collaborate with me, bringing her improvising skills into the mix. We recorded these pieces in one session and I took them home and added all the extra stuff. The composition came into place, as you will see in the video made. Um, inspiration came from Grain Rob's Above the Hill Suite, performed at the Third Eye in Glasgow. Uh, the title of this piece comes from a quote on that flyer, likely from the poet Anne Whitaker. Further archival materials came from video footage and documentation of the Sound and Syntax International Sound Poetry Festival where the late Lily Greenham performed. Uh, as a sound poet, she worked on her own tape loops for music that she coined lingual music, and it's really great to listen to, and it also inspired some of the rhythmical qualities in the piece you'll hear. Thanks for watching and listening. Only one. They're long actively, you know, learn from people who have you. Growing up with her famous students finally announcing.
Scratching, scratching, scratching. me out let me in and I'm out out went down to the water in search of a word and all I could find was hogweed, giant hogweed, hogweed crowding out the banks like a rainforest, hogweed flowering white as thrush, scented as elder, hogweed exotic in the Victorian postcard, hogweed the only plant survivor of a nuclear holocaust, hogweed towering above the flight of a biped, hogweed succeeding amidst harsh marsh market conditions. Hogweed, eyes upturned at the height of the argument. Hogweed, cauliflower blossom brains drying out in the sun. Hogweed, standing steadfast under the chance of rain. Hogweed, stuck in perma-adolescence. Hogweed, homogenizing like a monocrop. Hogweed, ornamental and phototoxic. Hogweed, scrolling past under the flick of a finger. Hogweed, monocarpic gazianum. Horkweed, Monstera has nothing on it. Hogweed, recolonary Hogweed, level headed rebel. 
Hogweed, reproduction unfolding ad infinitum. Hogweed, calling back to the embryonic. Hogweed, the end of bells around necks. Hogweed, the end of bells around towns. Hogweed, drawing a portrait from memory. Hogweed, having the last laugh. Growing as and why with an awful blue wardrobe, ancient wood. from from hmm. sometimes yellow Sometimes with an awful blue. River stones, friction. Inside oh, us, oh, with oh, inside oh. us, inside us, with a river flowing west, sitting together. Promise of cake. Small annoyances <laughs> flicked off like a bug. But grapes, socks freshly peeled, absurd shiny, a gift. You could to you out of place. Out of place. Perfume. 
Out of place. Mm. Dig proves Ooh. they were bursting out. Place. Place. Facets, they were totally strange brilliance on our paths through a dig. A big rough blue perfume of violets to forgive herself with a deep outrageous, now newly renewed side by side with these wide wings.
so the way that I came across that video, yeah, for a long time, been like looking for the pieces that I can be involved in or trying to find things that work. So, for example, big fan of NC, mm. Terry Riley, big fan of uh, Workers' Union, the Andreessen thing. Mm. Not American, but anyway, all of those kind of like more slightly free form in various ways, bits of music came across Mary Jane Leach, who's mm. an American composer who, yeah. yeah, who's like the person who's really responsible for getting Julius Eastman's stuff back out there, basically. So I came across her because she wrote a piece, what, 991 or something, a piece for like multi-track bassoons. I was looking for something in the kind of electric counterpoint, New York counterpoint style. So I came across her and then she's got a whole bit on her website about, about Julius Eastman. And then there's just a link to that video, Vimeo, Vimeo video, and there's a there's a recording of the piece, which is kind of cool. But that video really like got got me a lot. Um, like really watched it a lot of times. Um, mm -hmm. Partly just like aesthetically, it's cool and it's like really gnarly and grainy, and you kind of can't really tell what it would have sounded like in the room. Even sounds mm -hmm. like very boxy and like, but it just like such a intense performance like mm. incredible so i just got like deep deep into that but i wanted to play it At the end of my degree i had to I had to do some performances so it kind of fitted into that music written for bassoon especially like solo music is so bad <laughs> so so bad so i so i had to like dig find dig, dig deep into the um and and you know find find ways of doing music that i was interested in um instead of taking the same rubbish off the shelf and and then I and I did stay on it and there's no score so the only way was to <clears throat> transcribe it I watched the video a lot of times I listened to the recording a lot of times so there's like a studio recording from maybe a few years later which is a bit studio and th there's kind of people there's like uh, various things people saying like oh yeah we kind of did that but it wasn't really like how it been when we were taking it on tour and it was a bit mm. tame and like and I felt like that, you know, a few other groups have done versions of that piece um, and usually seem like they've more or less based on that studio recording. Mm -hmm. So, so I was like very much going to use that as my framework, but also it's kind of obvious that his score was really loose. I mean, there wasn't mm -hmm. a score by the time they did that performance, there's no score left, I don't think. So by trying to find a way to keep it really free, a few kind of clues and, you know, like, I will do it again at live some point and I'll probably do it quite differently. There were some clues that actually it was like um it kind of structured in different blocks which were like triggered by a different musician playing a different pitch or something, uh, rather than being a kind of linear thing, which I didn't do because like just mindfuck and like <laughs> hard to hard to do. You 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 need like a yeah, a European tour to like really mm time to, to get something like that um uh so so i wanted to like try and um give it that sense of freedom without it being like that kind of um totally random in structure so mm. and then also i didn't want it to be like a copy i didn't want to write out a transcription of bit of the piece i wanted it to be of the of that performance I wanted it to be a kind of structure with the same riffs and mm. stuff in it, or some of the same riffs. Also, I had to make it shorter because of programming restraints. So I think mm. the video is maybe 40 minutes long and I had to get it down to like 20, 25. Mm. And I have done longer performances since. So it'd be good to do a you know hour long someday. <laughs>
Center is not a school, which is a recent, more recent school, which is a purely foundational uh, school, and one on which uh, the composer just gives an idea about the piece, and then the performer carries it out. Of course, this last uh, form, some performers have complained about. They say that they're making the piece in a credit. What I have tried to do in this piece is to try to, uh, <coughs> without using the notes, try to use the musician's innate musical abilities. Those are hearing, that's it, hearing how to be hear music. Um, the form uh, is like this, and that is, there are certain notes which trigger certain rhythmic patterns. And uh, these are the notes which can be played by the performer at any time he likes. Now, of course, there's a whole long series about it, and, but some notes carry uh, more strong than others, it's like sort of circuitry. And some other notes have a shorter life than others. So, and these notes are played by the musician, and the others have to respond to those notes. And the point is, by using the musician's innate ability to hear what those notes like that you have on the page, it creates a certain tension because the music is very slick. That is the second when you're off, one note is wrong. Uh, the second thing that I've tried to concern myself with, and that is, that is the beat in American music emanating uh, from uh, black people. Uh, in America now, there is this. There's a, a school of music which tries to bring the beat back into classical music. And that is what's my second discipline. 
This is my voice, my weapon of choice. This is life. This is life. This is a plate. This is a cup. This is a story I didn't make up. This is a girl lost in the wood. Some covered wagon from some other hood. of the hands, this is technology, mixed with the band. Desert. 
strange heaven, this. He retreats from the singularity of his own language to assert the primacy of the digital file, constantly invoked to seek images on his behalf.
Thank you. 
the heart of the maze, the maze of the heart. Say what? Say what? Why what? Why what? You venture inside the heart of the maze, the maze of the heart. Say what? Why what? Do what? Do what? Do what you must do. There isn't a clue without you, without me. There isn't a clue without you. Da -da -da, da -da -da. I'm feeling my hands sensing along the clue of a chord from you to me. Sensing the chord from me to you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm.